Good morning. And grace and peace to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to our worship service today as we begin Holy Week, as uh, this is Palm Sunday. Uh, a, a word of welcome to any guests or visitors who are here. We'd encourage you, as well as everyone, to sign in on the registration cards found in the pews. And we'd like to also welcome you to stay for a time of coffee and fellowship following the worship service today as well. We want to welcome those who are listening in to our videotape ministry, those at Sibley Specialty Care, Hartwood Heights, uh, Country View Manor, as well as our shut-ins and our homebound. I have uh, just a few announcements to draw your attention to. Uh, there will be uh, a couple of offerings today. The first one will be for the Property Needs Fund, and uh, instead of for that, it's going to go for the Fellowship Hall Acoustics uh, Project. And uh, we're, so that collection will be taken for that on the first offering. And then the second offering will be uh, split between uh, Loving God and Loving People offering for Kids Against Hunger. And then um, that will be, uh, also be, uh, make sure you mark on your line there, K-A-H for that and as well. So, uh, and then also the mission fund will be done at the same time. So we got like three offerings to keep track of. So please uh, take note of that. Chancel Choir will practice after today's service. You're going to be singing on Easter Sunday. And then uh, this is a busy week, Monday, Thursday. We have our soup and bread uh, meal as well as communion that will follow the Monday, Thursday service. If you can, I think we're missing two breads. If you can help out with that, please uh, sign up for that. And then we still need a 2018 VBS assistant, uh, and also partnership inquiry classes are starting up. If you're interested in membership or partnership, please, please let us know at the office. And a reminder, yesterday we did not have our session retreat because of the weather, and we're going to be doing that this afternoon at 1 to 4. And then we have a sunrise service on Sunday, next Sunday at 6.30, uh, followed by the... Um, the meal that will be served afterwards, and then we'll also be having communion uh, on the regular service as well. A reminder, the lilies for the cross, if you have a lily uh, and you want to give in memory of someone, uh, you're welcome to call Ectors, and then they'll make sure they're delivered here next Saturday. Uh, also, we need Passion Play people to help with child care. Uh, the Passion Play will be this Friday from services 5, 7, and 9. And then... For prayer concerns, uh, prayers go out to the families of, of Dorothy Reck, that's uh, Al Reck's uh, um, aunt, and uh, she passed away this past week, and her funeral service was held on March 21st, so pray for Al and his family in regard to that. And then we had uh, one updated prayer concern that went out uh, this morning, I think, Lois Stoffrin's husband, Hubert is having colon cancer at the VA hospital in Sioux Falls on March 29th on a Thursday. So we're praying for a successful surgery for that and a good recovery. And then Jasmine Thomas Thompson uh, is recuperating at home following her shoulder surgery. Um, and those are, I think Frank started his chemo treatment on Friday and Bob Hall started his uh, second round of pills this last Sunday. Those are the updates I have. Any others anyone would like to share? Pastor Terry, you have my notice there. Yes. Um, Pastor Terry mentioned that we uh, have a need for assistant Bible school directors, and um, we would really appreciate if there would be anybody willing to just follow along with us this year and um, just be helping fill and helping to run. Also, um, registration for Bible school, the table is set up, and there's also sign-ups for people to help with that as well in all different capacities. So if you have any questions, I'll be out there um, following the service. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rochelle. Any other announcements? If not, let us stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ.
Please join me in the call to worship. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Hosanna. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Hosanna. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna. Let us pray. Hosanna, save us. Today we join our praise that to that joyful Palm Sunday procession. But we also see you weeping as you enter your capital city as king. So we join our grief to yours. Grief over un our unwillingness to be gathered under your wing. King Jesus, turn our hearts away from our own agenda for your rule. And let your kingdom come to us in grace this day. Your will be done. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 174, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, and the words will be on the screen. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. O oh God, our Father, hold all this close for the kingdom of our hearts is seeking you. It begins with Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the way to the cross to forgive our sins through his innocent suffering and death. We see our own failures mirrored in the passion story. We know we betray the trust given to us. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. 
As far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe in the good news. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are truly forgiven. Amen. While the choir is uh, going to their seats, I'd invite the children to come up for this morning's uh, children's message.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Good. Good. That's good to hear. Do you guys know what day this is? Sunday. Yeah. How would you know that? Uh, it's a brown oh, okay. Yeah. And you carried in palms too, right? Okay. Well, today we have uh, a verse in scripture that uh, talks about uh, Jesus saying that we're kind of like little chicks. We'll go ahead and put that on the screen there. Um, and that God and Jesus are kind of like a hen. Uh, Jesus said, Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Uh, do you see the baby chicks there? Uh -huh. uh, where are they? Under the wings. Under the wings. And, and what's, what, what's the purpose of that? What, what? Keep them warm, protect them. Okay, God's a lot like that. As long as we stay connected to him, we stay in communication to him, uh, we can stay protected. You can go to the, the next slide. And sometimes, Jesus, we, we kind of run away from him, don't we? And sometimes we get near danger. And uh, what's the chicken doing here, the mother hen? Uh, she's defending the chicks. Yeah, kind of defending, chasing them away, gathering her chicks in. Uh, have you ever been chased by a mother hen that was protecting her chicks? Uh, I think there's some adults out here that that's probably happened to. I know it. I know I remember as a child one time on the farm, and uh, those lo those hens can be pretty mean. They come right after you, and yeah. Well, Ben knows. You guys got big. Yeah, yeah, you got dogs too, huh? Yeah. The, and the dogs weren't really maybe trying to harm them as much as they were just leading them astray. And and that's sometimes what Jesus does. It's kind of help bring us back into the fold back into God's protection, and that as long as we, st we stay, what, near Jesus, he can, he can keep us safely in the fold. You can go to the last sign. Because, you see, without Jesus Christ, without Christ to keep us within that fold, we can get lost, and, and we can get away from him, and, and something bad might happen to us. But as long as we stay close and under his wings, under his care, God will, God will protect us. So on this Palm Sunday, uh, that's what I, I want you guys to remember. You'll hear that verse uh, uh, being spoken here a little bit later. But um, let me pray for you. And uh, since we are talking about little chicks, um, I have a bunch of eggs uh, to give you, okay? And hopefully I have enough to go around. I have two bags, so... Um, because what's in an egg, eventually? If you let it go long enough, it will turn into a, a baby chick, right? Do you guys like little chicks? Yes. They're cute when they're little, and they they're have to feed them, and you have to keep them warm, don't you? Yes. Because if they don't have a mom, they don't have anyone to keep them warm. Yeah, they kind of go through an ugly phrase, too, don't they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, that never happens to any of you, do you? Do you ever go through an ugly stage where... I think every one of us adults can maybe look back to our life and remember a time when, boy, we didn't look so good at that point, but um, we all turn out uh, really quite beautiful, and, and you guys are all beautiful, um, so let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your promise to gather us like a hen, uh, to protect us, to put it under your wings, to know that, Lord, we can go to you at any time, and, and you will be there to give us a safe haven. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the way you wrap your arms around us, uh, your wings around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I'm going to uh, pour this out in the bowl. And you guys can all have one. Whoa. If you take two, you've got to give one away. <laughs> You can give one away. There might be somebody that would like one. I don't want to end up with all of them. There you go. <laughs> Oops. At this time, I would invite our 
ushers to come forward for our first offering. And again, this one is for the acoustics uh, collection for the, for the fellowship hall. Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 65, 1 through 3, and 17 through 19. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me, to a nation that did not call on my name. I said, here I am, here I am. All day long I have held out my hands to obscene people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its and his people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and Take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard no more in it. Our gospel reading is from Luke 13, 31 through 35, found in your NIV Bible, page 1621, and in the children's Bible, page 1146. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on, on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, or surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, as you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our hymn of preparation is All Glory, Laud, and Honor, number 173, and the words will be on the screen. Thank you.
Will you please remain standing for our gospel reading as we continue in the gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 37 through 41. Hear now the word of our Lord. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is he, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, these very stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you where your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls, and they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, and the actions of our lives be accepted, O oh Lord, as you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is a, a familiar day to most of us. The children come in with palm branches, singing their loud hosanna, loud hosanna, and the Gospel of Matthew gives us the hosannas, Jesus riding on a donkey and a colt. The Gospel of John gives us palm branches, and Luke takes us back to the birth of a king. How often have we been here with King Jesus on this day as he comes into Jerusalem to be crowned with, crowned with thorns and to ascend the throne of a cross where he brings us salvation and peace? What new information can we gather from the texts that deal with this day, Palm Sunday? If we pay close attention to Luke, we may notice something is out of place. It doesn't seem to go along with all the other details about the shouting of Hosanna's praying and praising God. In the midst of all these blessings, in the midst of all this praise, Jesus stops and weeps. Luke is the only one who includes this scene. It shows Jesus had tremendous love for Jerusalem and all of its people. But it's also talking about a present and both a future judgment. However, this is not the first time that Jesus ever wept or lamented over the city of Jerusalem. In our reading from Luke 13, you may recall sometime before Palm Sunday, actually on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus is pointing to his coming death, and he speaks of a lament for the city of Jerusalem. Using language reminiscent of Old Testament prophets, Jesus spells out the result of Jerusalem's failure to embrace him. In that all, as always it seems, prophets always die in Jerusalem. And Jesus knows at this point he is headed for his death. However, the tragedy is not his, it's Israel's. And so Jesus cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills its prophets and stones those who are sent. He says, How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you, in reference to Jerusalem, you were not willing. And then being prophetic even more, he goes on to say, You will not see me again until that day you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and how true that was. But you see, Jesus is predicting the judgment that is to come. And rather for Jerusalem to be under God's shadow and protective wing, the people of that city will be exposed, empty, and at risk. 
and their repetitive sin and rejection of God will more often than not, and as it does for us as well, it brings us emptiness when we reject God. Just how passionate was Jesus for Jerusalem? Well, it's evident in that as he approaches the city on Palm Sunday, the place where he stops on the hillside of the Mount of Olives gives him a perfect overlooking view of the city of Jerusalem. He can see its four walls. He can see the magnificent temple of Herod. He can see the golden gate through which he's going to enter. He can see all of the city from this viewpoint on the hillside. And as he does this, he wept. It's important to note, though, that the verb for wept here is different than it was when he wept for Lazarus when he brought him out of the grave, our shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. For here the word wept in John's gospel refers to Jesus shedding tears like one does when, when tears well up in your eye and they kind of trickle down your face. And, and some people call that silent tears. But here in Luke... Uh, when it's referring to Jesus wept, it's different. It's in a form of audible weeping, like when we are overcome emotionally and, and our emotions get the best of us, but we can't help but to cry out loud and maybe even hardly get our breath. We lose control. And so if that happened, what caused Christ to be so overcome with emotion that at that point he stops and weeps over the city, cries out loud over the city? Well, think about it. It's the very going to be the very last week of his earthly life and his ministry. In another few days, he's going to be crucified. And this is going to be his last visit to Jerusalem, the, the capital city. But that's not all, for Jesus reveals in the text to us, he says, even if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Of all places, of all places, Jerusalem, full of Pharisees and teachers of the law who knew the text frontwards and backwards, they of all cities should not have missed this important event. Their rejection of Jesus would be the cause of his death. The peace he spoke of would not be theirs because there were going to be national consequences for their rejecting him as their Messiah. Jesus describes, actually, what's going to happen. He says that, uh, in, in roundabout terms, uh, a military siege will slowly choke the city to death. Rome will do that some 40 years later in 70 AD, as they will surround the city, lay siege to it, cut off all their supply for food, and the people and the people inside will get so desperate, so hungry, that some will be led to cannibalism. And when Rome finally enters a city, they will level it. They will burn it. The temple, walls, uh, the great temple, all of it will come down to rubble. Uh, the walls surrounding the city will be knocked down. It will be a desolate Even historian Josephus uh, actually confirms this and says that this is exactly what happened, uh, just as Jesus had predicted. And so at this very point, Jesus is overlooking this city, envisioning what's going to happen to it sometime down the road. And so he cries out loud for the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, because they were not willing they were not willing to accept him. And he was crying because he was not willing to let anyone perish. You see, Jerusalem had been preparing hundreds of years for the Messiah's coming, yet Jesus shows up and they don't know him. It's just as the Gospel of John tells us in his prologue. He says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. It had to hurt that the Jews of Jesus' day were going to reject him, that they were going to miss their moment. Not only that, they were going to bring judgment down upon themselves. And perhaps all this causes our hearts to join Jesus' lament as we witness the unwillingness of people who live outside God's will today. 
All around us, there are people that seem to be turning away from God's will and the timeless truths. And as we said a couple of weeks ago, all too often our worldview is not matching God's. And so many are rejecting God instead of turning towards him. However, it's always easy, easier to see someone else's unwillingness than to, to look at our own. We are all called to be Jesus' disciples, to the world around us. And after all, we would never unwillingly reject and oppose God's will in our lives, would we? We wouldn't do that. Well, before you answer, remember the disciple Peter didn't think so either, yet when push came to reach shove, he rejected God's plan to send Jesus to the cross. And he denied even knowing Jesus three times, so it can happen to us as well. Because how many times have we denied Jesus Christ? How many times have we been unwilling to claim our Christian identity, to say we are a Christian? How many times have we been unwilling when other people were rejecting or uh, uh, denying our biblical values and truths that we didn't say anything? And how many times have we been too embarrassed to claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Are we really any better than those fickle Jews on that day? Well, here's the thing. Jesus knows all about us. <laughs> Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes, of whom we must give account. Jesus knows all about us. We can't keep it from him. He knows our unwillingness to let go of a grudge, to bring ourselves to forgive, to, to follow him completely. But remember this, Jesus never stops loving us. He never stops. And being unwilling to follow Jesus can happen to anyone. In the late 1940s, Charles Templeton was a close friend and a preaching associate of the late Billy Graham. He effectively preached to large crowds in major arenas. However, intellectual doubts began to, to nag him, and he, and he questioned the truth of Scripture and, and the core beliefs. And he finally abandoned his faith, and, and he tried to uh, unsuccessfully uh, uh, attempt to get Billy Graham to do the same, but he didn't. And Templeton resigned from ministry. He became a novelist, a commentator, and a critique of the Christian faith. Here's where it gets interesting. Journalist Lee Strobel interviewed him for his book, The Case for Christ. Some of the things Templeton said for leaving the faith was when he considered the diseases that sweep across this land and indiscriminately kill, more often than not, painfully, all kinds of people, whether they're ordinary, decent, or rotten, he said it became crystal clear to him that it's not possible for an intelligent person to believe that there is a deity who loves us, yet just lets all that happen. It just couldn't make sense to him. And so Lee Strobel asked him about Jesus, and he was uh, surprised at his response. Templeton believed Jesus lived, but he never really considered Jesus to be God. And, and he said, Jesus is the greatest human being that's ever lived. He's a moral genius. His an ethical sense is unique. He was intrinsically the wisest person that ever encountered, I've ever encountered in my life or my readings. He's the most important person in my life. And it may sound strange, but I have to say that I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. He's the most important human being who has ever existed, and, and he said, I missed him. And Lee Strobel said, tears began to form in Templeton's eyes, and he wept freely. But he refused to say that Jesus was God incarnate, God in the flesh. So just as Jesus wept for the unrepentant, unwilling citizens of Jerusalem, he wept for Charles Templeton. And Jesus still weeps for unrepentant, unwilling sinners today, like us. And remember, Jesus did not only weep for sinners, he wept for suffering judgment <clears throat> that their rejection of him would bring. And the same could be said of us. There are two responses we can glean from this text. First, if you've never 
submitted your life to Jesus Christ, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Your king has come. Do not put it off. Do not delay. We do not know when we will die. None of us know that. But we do know that when we die, we will all come before Jesus as our judge and king. Our second response as Christians should be this. When is the last time we wept for people, people who did not know Jesus Christ, who unwillingly were turning from him? Do we have that same gut-wrenching compassion for those who are still lost in their sins, people that we know could even be family members? Do we grieve for them like Jesus grieves for us? Knowing if they don't accept Jesus Christ, they are on their way to to hell. Bishop J.C. Ryle said, We know but little of true Christianity if we do not feel a deep concern about the souls of those who are unconverted. To care nothing whether our neighbors are going to heaven or hell is in no doubt the way of the world. But if Christ felt tenderly for the lost people, we want to be like Jesus and seek those who are lost. And as disciples of Christ, we should. Today is Palm Sunday. And as we sing and celebrate the coming of a king who ascended the throne of a cross, let us confess our own unwillingness to follow him, to mourn like he does for those who are lost. Let us trust and love uh, trust in the love of God in Jesus that is so relentlessly pursuing us. Jesus never gives up on us. Jesus will always love us. And let us pursue all those around us with that same compassion, love, mercy, and grace that he so freely has offered us. Go out and bring in the lost. Don't be afraid to speak to your neighbor. If you see someone that is hurting and doesn't know Jesus, reach out to them. It is our Christian duty. Amen. Let us pray. O humble King, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with palm branches and praises, we, we welcome you into our midst as we travel down the road to the cross and the empty tomb. Help us to continue to welcome you into our midst, into our homes and our neighborhoods. And when we go to work, whether it's at work or when we go to school, help us to sing your praises and to glorify your name in all that we say and do, knowing that it is through you alone that we can have everlasting life. And most caring Christ, so often we have unwillingly wandered away from your embrace and turned away from your extension of love toward us. Return us from our wandering ways. Restore us in a right relationship with you through the forgiveness you so freely offer and grant us peace and rest as this can be found only in your grace and mercy. So many in this world are unwilling to listen to you, O Lord. Help us to reach out to them with the same passion you did for us. Help us to love them unconditionally and to be your messengers of hope to those who are lost or hurting. And give us courage to bring them into your fold and share the good news with them. Ever-present Lord, reveal to us ways in which we can gather more and more often as your brothers and sisters of the faith. Bind us together in a meaningful prayer life. Speak to us in your word the great mysteries of the faith and guide us now by your Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, as we pause and reflect on those who are, who are lost and grieving and sick and discouraged, we, we lift up those on our own prayer chain for, for Bob Halls as he deals with colon cancer, for, for Beverly uh, Wiley, um, Les Powers' sister who face end-of-life issues, for those who have uh, dealt with loss in their life, we think of Bob Halls, who is, who is now taking his second round of chemo, and for Frank Julius, who is uh, beginning his uh, first round of chemo this last Friday, we pray for both of them to have no ill effects and that uh, the chemo will, will do what it's supposed to. We give thanks that uh, uh, Sailor Manure has um, 
uh, Moncour has ended her treatment, and uh, Lord, we pray for continued good welfare for her, for Nelvina Popkes, who's battling cancer, and that her numbers would return and strengthen, as, as well as uh, Elijah's and Pam. Lord, we also think of, um, of those who will be having surgery here later this week. We pray for, for Hubert. We pray for him for this Thursday as he has surgery, Lord, and pray for healing for him. And Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We think of the family of Al Reck and the loss of his uh, aunt. And uh, Lord, we just pray for your comfort to be upon them. And Lord, we give thanks for all that you do for us, the way that you uh, communicate your love to us. And so we lay before you, Lord, our own community, the people who have more than they need and those, some who don't even have enough. For those who spend their days in schools, in offices, at homes, in shelters, in streets, or in the prison, all of your children, Lord, protect them, heal them, help us to know that, that we need to love one another as you have loved us. And Lord, we pray for our world, and we pray for our president and all of his staff. We pray for your guidance to direct their ways. And uh, from all the way from the Washington, D.C. to our own local government, Lord, May we be, uh, follow your will in all that we say and do. And Lord, we pray now that uh, you would guide us as a church in this holy week. Uh, Lord, help us to recall just what you did for us and see the passion that you had for us. And Lord, we pray these things. Now, praying that prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will be having our second offering, which is both for the mission fund offering as well as the loving God, loving people offering for Kids Against Hunger.
let us pray. Oh Lord, our God, as we begin this passion, this holy week, we're reminded of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf, your willingness to come and allow yourself to be crucified, to die for us. You gave us so much. You gave us your all. May these gifts that we lay before you represent a portion of our thanks for all that you have done for us. We pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we do our closing hymn, I just wanted to, to let you know that Jackson Byers was filling in for ja our Brooklyn Jansma this morning. So that was Jackson Byers. Our closing hymn then is The King is Coming and the Words are on the Screen. And now as you go out, remember that the king is coming. And all this will be possible because he came. 
and he died and he rose. This is the week that we celebrate that. Now receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay.